Good morning, everyone. This is Ben Ryan, and welcome to the Hedgeye Morning Macro Call for Monday, December 1st, 2014. Before I hand the call over to Keith, I'll hit on our changes in asset allocation from Friday. We're currently sitting at 64% cash. We decreased our fixed income exposure to 30% from 31%. We increased foreign currency exposure to 6% from 5% Friday. Commodities, international equity, and U.S. equity exposure is all held flat at 0%. With that, take it away, Keith. Thanks, Ben, and hopefully everyone had a great Thanksgiving. Just as a reminder, that pie chart on asset allocation is a netted pie chart. So again, it's net zero asset allocation. So again, if you had a 100% equities on the long side and 100% on the short side, you'd have a net zero position, and that's how we call it that way. The only uh, leaning long position we'd have and continue to say that with that is with the long bond on the fixed income side. So today's uh, top three things in my notebook, number one will be oil. It could really be number one, two, and three, but again, number one is oil, number two is Russia, and number three is Italy. Now, oil first, let's just kind of go into this breathtaking move for those who are not prepared for the deflation. As my friend Hemingway would say, it happened slowly, then all at once. So again, this is also called more affectionately a crash. Again, as you see this uh, really manifesting across not only energy stocks, but energy bonds. Don't forget that a large percentage of the incremental high yield bond market is related to the oil price. So again, it's an inflation expectation that is deflating. Uh, we have no immediate term trade support to 63 spot 86 on WTI. And again, the more important point is that now resistance is just north of 71. So again, it's 71, 72, 73, 75. A lot of companies, guess what? can't either pay their dividend and or make money in energy land, and that's the point. Point number two, Russia. Big problem in Russia. Now, a lot of people would say, because it's not happening in the S&P 500 futures or something like that, that they're navel-gazing at it, doesn't matter yet. Now, again, I actually heard David Rosenberg, who's a reasonably good risk manager, say, this is a lot like 1998 to the good side for Americans. This is a buying opportunity or something like that. This is not 1998. Newsflash, that's when you had nominal growth of over 6%. You know, this is called a worldwide gong show. That's what this is. Again, centrally planned markets with the Russians under their, really, I mean, underground at this point. The ruble is down 6% since Friday, since Friday, down 40% for the year to date. The only thing that looks like 1998 is called a foreign currency crash, Mr. Rosenberg. And again, that creates interconnected risk across a lot of things, which are not the least of which Russian stocks. Russian stocks down, again, over 3% this morning, down 32 percent for the year to date. Now, finally, last point is Italy. What, what could possibly go wrong with Italy? Uh, they had to report the economic data. That would be the main problem. So again, the economic data in Italy continues to suck. Now, Italy has a recession. And again, you can look at that for what it is, which is bad, uh, down 0.5 percent year over year GDP for the third quarter. And all the economic data in Europe continues to decelerate in rate of change terms. This morning, from Italy to France to Germany, you saw sub 50 on the November readings of PMI. So again, Mr. Draghi has not been able to take Italy out of a recession. He has not been able to create inflation expectations. That's why deflation is the number one position you should have worldwide in your global macro book. And those are your top three things. Now. Today in the S&P 500, fortuitously, we do have this on uh, for once on the short side on a down move. And guess what? We haven't had many down moves in the S&P 500. November was literally all up days. So don't worry, Apple and the S&P 500 will never go down. If that's your bull cases, good luck with that. Again, 2038 is immediate term trade support for the S&P 500 with 2080 as resistance. So again, 1.4% downside versus 0.6% upside. Again, that's how I roll. I like to buy them when they're low. I like to sell them when they're high. When you're at the top end of the risk range, you sell, and that's precisely what you did. Now, again, looking at the Russell 2000, uh, alongside this, what I would call nothing short of fascinating or mesmerizing narrative from Old Wall, old wall Media, I think they're going to combine Bloomberg and CNBC at this point. They were saying, oh, look, fantastic November for stocks, blah, 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 blah. Look, the Russell 2000, which I think is a pretty good barometer for stocks as opposed to the 30 that are in the Dow, the Russell 2000 was literally flat week over week, every week of November, every week. 1172, 1173, 1173, 1172. I think it was 1170, where did it close? It closed at 1173 on Friday. The Russell 2000 did nothing in November. So again, we reiterate that we like bonds. That's the best way to play growth slowing on the long side. T 
TLT, EDV, you know our positions. And we do not like a pure play focus on the short side of US domestic growth expectations, which is the Russell 2000. Again, the Russell 2000, flat, 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 flat. Shame on you for not calling it flat. Uh, looking at the range uh, in the VIX, currently the immediate term risk range in the VIX is 11 spot 98. Again, that is the immediate term risk range support. The intermediate term trend support for the VIX is down at 11.34. So again, the VIX is bullish trade, bullish trend. That is bearish for what? The Russell 2000, number one. Number two, oil stocks. Number three, the S&P 500 for a trade. So again, we'll see where this trade takes us. S&P 500 support again is 2038. And there's no resistance for the Russell 2000 up to 15 spot 53. Now volume, as you know, on the up moves last week was nowhere to be found. In fact, volume continued to crash. So again, for those who are forced to chase whatever rallies those are in equities, they are now in what you call a liquidity trap. So again, it's an elevator on the way up, and they're going to have to take the windows on the way out. A lot like between September and October. That was one nasty 150-point drop in the S&P 500, and we suggest you took a lesson from it. Now, if you took any lessons from what's going on in the rest of the world, just newsflash, the only things that are going up at this point are those markets that are centrally planned, really centrally planned and explicitly so. So get this, in Japan. Uh, and imagine, just imagine for two seconds this morning on your risk management morning after all that turkey that you said to yourself, what if U.S. auto sales were down like 1 or 2% year over year? That would probably be pretty bad, right? In Japan, they're down 13.5% year over year. 13.5%. So what you have to do on that is you've got to buy the Nikkei. I mean, this is exactly where we're at. So again, the only bull case that remains is really, really, really bad economic data. And again, that's called the Weimar Nikkei. We're using that analogy, obviously, to the 1920s Germany. They are explicitly burning their currency because their economy is burning. Again, Nikkei up on the day. But the rest of Asia, don't forget the rest of Asia, the rest of Asia, the Kospi, which is you know, South Korea, fairly large population, down 0.8%, remains bearish trend. The Hang Seng broke its trend line again. It was down 2.6% on the session. Uh, Australia, down 2%. Malaysia, down 2.3%. I'm sure you don't want to talk about Malaysia today when you can talk about your favorite retailer who's doing fantastic, allegedly, in the U.S. with no retail sales. Uh, again, just is unbelievable. Europe, across the board, can't go down a lot yet because, of course, there is a central planning event planned for Thursday. Now, if I call up my local hedge fund manager who is concerned about the next central planning catalyst, it is Thursday. So again, on Thursday, Draghi, who is no longer walking on water, is going to create a new level of water and walk on that. So again, it's get, admittedly, it's getting difficult to follow uh, because, again, you can't find it in economic recovery terms. You can only find it in people covering their shorts in European equities. So again, look at European equities for what they are. Russia continues to crash. Portugal down 2%. Italy down 1.5%. Again, the weakest countries are falling first. And then at some point, the DAX is going to start to go down faster again like it did in October. We currently still like France on the short side, and you know why? We do not like socialism, and we do not think that the French economy is going to recover due to an Italian saying he can walk on the water. Uh, again, looking at commodities across the board, Friday, in case you missed it, smack down, boom! Like, it's like, you know, Jeremy Pink said to me, we're getting a lot of questions. Yeah, you're damn right we're getting a lot of questions. The commodity index was down 5% on the day. I mean, on the day, this is a 19 complex commodity you know, uh, uh, calculation that people go through. That is ugly deflation. You can see deflation in break-evens. You can see deflation in tips. You can see deflation in CRB index. The only deflation I can't see this morning is in this belly of mine that completely got inflated this weekend. And the reality is that this is called deflation. So again, if you can't see it yet, you're never going to see it. And again, this is the big risk to inflation expectations, which include, by the way, most asset classes uh, worldwide. Looking at Dr. Copper just got pulverized last week, so you'd think that the deflation in copper, it was down 6% on the week, down another percent this morning, though. You know, down 6 and then down another percent, that's called a very, very bad situation if you're long copper. So again, you don't want to be long copper. You don't want to be long a company that mines copper. You don't want to be long a company that sells equipment to the damn guy who's mining the copper. Cat. Cat. Caterpillar. Caterpillar uh, uh, also sells equipment. Uh, to e &P companies, by the way, uh, which we're writing a note about again this morning. That is not a good thing to be writing uh, uh, at least uh, capital order flow towards. Again, when they're canceling orders, CapEx getting canceled. Again, that's one of the main reasons why investment in U.S. GDP growth continues to surprise people to the downside. Those that thought we were going to get real wage growth in a CapEx cycle, nada. 
Ten-year bond yield, again, in other news this morning, the ten-year bond yield continues to get you paid on the long side of the TLT. Again, the TLT, what is this damn TLT? This TLT is up 20% for the year to date. Like, versus the Russell, which is, that literally doesn't do anything every week at this point. Like, why is it so hard for you to just get up in the morning and accept the fact that the world has slowed and that you're getting paid? I mean, I think that it's fantastic. I have never ever, I mean, in my career at least, I had never really got this until now. So I'm quite happy about this. Two spot one five percent on the 10-year bond yield. Now you can get me, anyone and their brother or their dog's brother, economist's son's daughter, and you can tell them to tell me that falling bond yields is a pro-growth signal. Again. Dr. Rosenberg, this is not a pro-growth signal. This is not 1998. This is called growth slowing. That's why you would be long bonds, treasury bonds. Dan Alpert gets it. I get it. You got it. And that's what we're going to stick with this morning in both TLT and EDV terms, which are the two things that we currently have on in investing ideas. Finally, in currencies, don't forget that the interconnected risk or the correlation risk or both uh, of the yen trade is massive right now. So again, uh, you have the yen up this morning, 20 basis points. Now, if it were to go up again tomorrow, uh, you might actually have the Nikkei have to respond to that. Don't forget that their economic data is horrendous. Now, away from that economic data, China's PMI slowed. Uh, Japan's auto sales, I already talked about that. German's PM, Germany's PMI slowed. Actually, I mentioned all these things. Why would I go over these things again? That would sound like I'm being redundant. Uh, private equity, M&A Bank, Capital Markets. Uh, the Swiss gold referendum, which a lot of the um, a lot of people are kind of looking at this catalyst. I think it's the same crowd that's long Bitcoin still. But the reality is that it didn't. The, the referendum was 77% of people said they didn't want to save their gold. Guess what? A lot of people don't have any gold. <laughs> All right, Keith. Thanks. We got a good list of questions here. What specifically are you looking at this week on the macro calendar? <clears throat> uh, well, this week's interesting because you have. Um, in the U.S., you have the ISM manufacturing number for November. Expectations for that, don't forget, are very high because you had a 59 on the last print. Then you get the services component, which is more interesting to me uh, this morning because the services side of the economy is what makes the economy tick. And that, you know, again, alongside Bloomberg this morning, which is a rarity for Bloomberg. Uh, you know, as you know, into the midterms, there are very, very, uh, very positive headlines, suspiciously positive headlines from the Bloomberg. Uh, you know, the Bloomberg comes out this morning saying uh, that the, the action, their number one economic headline, and I, and I quote, Black Friday sales fizzle as sales fall 11% according to the National Retail Federation. Now, when you have to quote reality, that's a totally different thing than the midterms. But what I want to see is the flow through to what that actually meant in the, in the services side of the U.S. economic numbers. As most of you know, the jobless claims numbers have been surprising the wrong way for the last three weeks. So again, if you start to get the headline data falling, much like consumer spending has, and retail sales, don't forget, have been missing, and they did miss again this weekend, then I think that that's where the ball starts to roll to the negative side in what was probably the best performing sector last week, consumer discretionary. A lot of people have the same thesis again uh, on oil prices. Oil prices down is the new bull case. Don't forget that oil prices at 107 weren't the bear case, but again, I'm, I'm just trying to keep track of it all. Well, we have some questions about oh, that. Oh, by the way, but one other thing before I forget, I'm, I'm in rant mode. Uh, ECB on Thursday and then the jobs report on Friday. Can you imagine if the jobs report is as bad as jobless claims have been? Woo! <laughs> so on this, uh, on this deflating oil and deflating energy, um, if 70% of the economy is cons consumption driven, at what point does this decline ultimately help the consumer? Well, it's, I mean, look at the expectations of the marketplace. Expectations are for the consumer to take off like a bat out of hell. You're going to get all these poor people in America, the two-thirds of America that, by the way, is in a recession. They have negative real wage growth. They haven't participated in any economic expansion. All of a sudden, they're just going to blow out of you know, whatever, you know, whatever basement they're in or garage or whatever, you know, the, the home or apartment, and they're just going to go shopping. They're just going to go to Kohl's and spend their entire whatever they had left. And if they don't have that, they're going to use their credit card because gas prices are low. Newsflash, not everybody, A, has a car, B, can afford a car, and C, a lot of people take the bus. So what I'd like to see is all these people rejoice 
in kind of, you know, this kind of fanfare that Wall Street has that this is the new bull case. My big problem with this is that the rest of people's cost of living complex continues to be very, very high. That would include food. That would include shelter. That, by the way, for the median consumer is half of their spending basket. That would include education. That would include, like, literally your bus ticket. Tell me one thing that is deflating at the pace of oil prices right now. And what you're going to see is in that basket, the median consumer in America, again, if you separate the country by quintile, the median consumer's spending basket, 6.4% is on gas prices. Yes, it's good, but it's not the savior for the country. And that's why I think Bloomberg had to run that, that headline this morning. Retail sales continue to miss in the face of Wall Street just jumping from thesis to thesis to thesis that everything's going to be fine. And I just don't think that it is. All right, great. Well, we'll try to do some rapid fire here. St are you staying along with the TLT? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The TLT, I love. I'm going to get a tattoo of the TLT. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this, you you kind of already answered this, but just maybe maybe it's easier to just you know, put it right out there. What's your risk range in, on the Russell? Uh, risk range for the Russell is 1153 to 1190. If you break 1153, you literally, it's like Geronimo. I mean, you don't have any support to 1005. All right, great. And then, uh, then moving to oil here, what, uh, how low can oil go? I mean, you're, you know, we're almost right down to your trend, trend line of resistance. What if it breaks through that? Well, it, like this morning's interesting because now the whole news flow again. You know, these these financial media outlets, they're all paid to drive something. So now it's like, who can come out with the like lowest level of an oil pricing? You know, so in other words, let's find all the people that didn't tell you it was going to go from 100 to 65, and they're all going to be quite sure that you're going to go from 65 to 40. I mean, that's next to useless, which is not going to get you a whole heck of a lot of stuff. The point about oil is the price deck. It's how many companies can their debt, pay their dividend, make money, not cut CapEx with this level of oil, even within the risk range. So our current risk range for oil is 63 spot 86 to 71.12. What that means is that that's the probable range. And again, every 90 minutes, I redo this range. And what you'll note is that the top end of the range is going lower and the lower end of the range for oil is going lower. That's called lower highs and lower lows. So people who look at charts, you would understand that. If you don't look at charts, hopefully you still understand that. It's a real, it's a real simple expectation thing. So again, that's the point about the price deck. Most companies can't, never mind companies, countries can't make money uh, with oil anywhere sub 95, don't forget. So again, this is a disaster. This is going to have huge ramifications and interconnected problems across the world. You don't have to have some newsy headline of 30 to $40 oil. What you needed was in September for somebody to tell you that oil could go down fast, which it already did. And now we're just confirming the point that the market was warning on two months ago. All right, you might answer this question uh, in a similar manner. Nine, just 900 gold anytime soon? 900? Um, gold does not look healthy. I mean, if you look at gold for what it, you know, the problem with gold, and we've said this over and over again, and we've, we liked it earlier in the year, I actually liked it at the beginning of the year, it had a big run, and then obviously the dollar started to run, and we got out of gold and started saying, look, we're not gonna just ride this horse for no, for no other reason other than liking gold. We're not these people, you know, again, we're very, very uh, uh, much mixed on the metal. We'll do whatever those signals are telling us to do on the metal. But the prime signal that I look for in gold is falling rates and falling dollar. That's when you buy gold. When the dollar is rising or ripping people a new one to the upside, you don't want to be buying a ton of gold because, again, you're going to get chances to buy it lower. So, again, I don't, I don't have 900 in my current risk range for gold. I actually have 1157 to 1192. But the bigger problem in gold is that the trend line of resistance for gold is 1223. So, put another way, if you can't get above 1223, I don't like gold. All right. Uh, on Europe, <clears throat> what about Europe from here? Is it time to buy low? No. I mean... I just cannot, I can't. I mean, maybe that's clearly one of my problems. One of my non-problems is that I can't. You know, I can also short Europe. We've shorted, I think, France 14 times this year and made money 14 times in a row. I mean, but I cannot, and again, it's my problem, not yours. I cannot run out and put my own money into buying a market with these kinds of economic and structural uh, fundamentals. I can't. I just can't go to my wife one day and say, hey, look, you know, we're along a ton of Portugal and Greece, and you know, I got really long France because this guy Draghi was going to come out one day and tell me all that work that I ever did my entire life doesn't matter anymore because he's going to save us. I mean, I just, for the life of me, I just can't do it. So call me crazy, call me Keith, call me something else. Uh, that's the way that I look at Europe. I'm not buying Europe. Are you, are you, I think other people would be crazy to take the other side of that. 
All right, great. And then uh, on the on this on the commodity deflation, I mean, how how does the uh, you know, how does the pyramid collapse with falling oil prices for energy companies? Well, it's yeah. It's, yeah, it's really simple. I mean, it started with again the fall in oil prices really started with the rise of Japan's panic. So again, most people don't really agree with that, and that's fine. But that's exactly what the market's correlation trade did. So again, the yen went down. The, the Japanese said, we got to burn this sucker one more time because we're going to get fired. Abe was going to and probably will get fired. Again, nine out of the last 10 years, you've, you've had a new um, quote unquote prime minister in France because they continued to fail. Or in, in Japan, in France and Japan, same thing. But the point is that the yen started to go down in a ball of flames. The dollar went up. Oil started to correlate to the downside. The current correlation risk between the US dollar and the oil price is like 0.93. So in other words, it's an inverse correlation. So if you get the dollar right to the upside, you're going to be getting oil right to the downside. So again, follow how the, the, the pile comes crashing down. Think chaos theory, complexity theory terms, where you have a pile of sand. And again, you keep dropping piles or incremental data points on top of that pile. And again, yen down equals dollar up equals oil down equals energy stocks down equals energy bonds down equals energy stocks and bonds with a lot of leverage, let's say, five times debt to said EBITDA, which is called Lin Energy, an MLP, upstream MLP company, uh, now you're really in trouble because the company is completely levered to everything that we just had in the pile. So again, that's how the whole thing breaks down. And again, what it really is, is it's an, it's an illustration of inflation expectations breaking down from a pile of sand perspective. So again, people expect the leading indicator for dividend growth for an MLP company, which is oil prices in this case, to go up. As soon as they start to expect that to go down, then they expect the future cash flows to go down. Then they expect the dividend that they were going to get paid to go down. Then they expect the stock to go down. It's really simple when you boil it down to what's actually happened. And again, it's inflation versus deflation. You as an investor need to figure out which one you think we're going to have next. All right, great. Good stuff, Keith. Um, thanks, for, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Busy week this week, and good luck out there. We'll see you back here tomorrow, same time.